Welcome uh, to our second uh, of these primers um, in the series. And just to remind you, those that haven't um, been to the first one, that the Stanley Center program meeting has devoted a few of their, their program meetings to these uh, primers that are on topics that are relevant and of interest to the community. And, um, and today, the topic is on the compliment system, the compliment cascade, um, which I know many of you know here at the Stanley Center and at the Broad is, is a really a, a critical pathway um, in innate immunity. Of course, that's a traditional role, but more and more with the emerging genetics is pointed to a role of C4 and the classical complement cascade in neuropsychiatric diseases such as schizophrenia, but also lupus and others. Um, and so understanding how this pathway works, uh, how it's activated, how it's regulated, um, there's no one better to tell us about that than Michael Carroll, who we're very happy to have here today. Uh, Mike, Mike is a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. He's been um, a director of the immunology graduate program. He's uh, been in the immunology uh, department for many years and is no one better knows compliment than Mike. Uh, he cloned the first human C4. He cl cloned human C4. Uh, he's made the first genetic knockouts of these uh, C4 and C3. That's enabled us uh, as a field to understand the function of these genes and, and proteins in the both in the, in the immune system and now in the brain. Um, and I think Mike's had a long-standing interest in understanding really the diverse biological functions of the classical complement cascade. And what you're going to learn today, there is going to be some nitty-gritty to try to understand how it works. But I would say from this community, if we don't understand the biochemistry of complement and we don't understand how it's regulated, we're not going to be able to understand the mechanisms and uh, underlying. Um, the, the role of these uh, genes and pathways in diseases like schizophrenia. And if we're ever to think about therapeutics or biomarkers, we need to understand uh, the kinds of things that Mike's going to tell us about today. So in part one, uh, Mike's going to kick it off, uh, and then he's going to turn uh, the mic over to Jessie Presume, who's a postdoc in Mike's lab, who, um, who's terrific, and she's probably going to focus a bit more on some of the work that's related to microglia and some of the work she's doing uh, on this topic uh, that related to neuro neuroscience. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to them, and I just want to remind you that this will also be posted on, uh, on YouTube and on our archive so that you guys can go back. If you've missed something, you can go back and, and learn more. Um, but I want to pass this over to Mike and thank them both for coming today. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, Beth. Um, it's a real pleasure for me having worked in the complement field for many, many years. Um, mainly thinking of the complement system and how, how its impact on, on immunology. And I think, in, 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 at least in the immunology field, I think the, the current, a lot of the thinking has been by students that, well, we know everything because someone published a complement pathway map a number, maybe every decade it's, it's, it, it changes a bit. Um, and students are always kind of, well, we know all about complement because we can look it up in Janeway, we can look at the map at C1 and C3, C4. And I said, well, but you know, you really need to understand it. And so um, with, with a little trepidation today when I put this together, because I want, I'd like for you to be excited about the way I am, and, uh, and I think many of you may be, but there are some details <laughs> that uh, one, one needs to think about. And so what I tried to do is put it together in a way that these components we know are interesting because if you don't have them, you get this disease. Not emphasizing the disease aspect, but just, just as an example. I think that, that at least helps me keep my view a bit balanced. So um, as, um, as Beth mentioned, we are really two parts. I'd like to, to um, let's see, this is, yeah. We've really divided it into two parts. One, just going through the complement system, how the, path, how the different components work with each other, if, they're, if you're missing certain components, how that leads to deficiency, because this is really how the field uh, learn what connects to what. And then the second part, Jesse is going to give a more defined example of how copy number variation and polymorphism at the C4 locus can predispose one to schizophrenia. So I always like to look at the historical point of view, and the, the Jules Bourdais, who was a Belgian uh, physician, working with Metchnikoff uh, in, the, in what late 1800s, was really the first one to recognize that, that antibodies, it was known that antibodies binding to bacteria from studies from Ron Baring and others, it was, it was clear that antibodies were critical for neutralizing pathogens, 
But what wasn't clear was how it actually, how the effector function came about. And it was really Jules uh, genius to put it together. Well, there's something else in serum, it's a complement that's facilitating that, that interaction and leading to the death of the microbe. So that really was the discovery of the first component, which is called C1. I won't go through each one, but what I'd like to do is st to start out is to give an overview, because there are, there are roughly 30 serum proteins and cell surface receptors that go together and that are under the umbrella of a complement system, and trying to put that together in a way that it's understandable, that, that you can walk away and remember some of it. I've really put, I've used this table from Mark Walport that was published a few years ago in the New England Journal, and at that time, Mark segregated the complement system into three physiological roles, host defense uh, and, and infection, which was probably one of the original uh, uh, functions that was, uh, people thought about. Secondly, interface between, between innate and adaptive immunity that we've, that at least my lab has put a lot of effort into trying to understand how the complement system really sets the stage in some cases acting as a natural adjuvant for activation of, of adaptive immunity. And then the third part, uh, disposal of waste, which we'll briefly talk about. Defects in clearance of apoptotic cells can actually lead to diseases such as lupus. And then well, I think probably one of the more exciting areas that, that has arisen over the last few years, in large part because of the discovery by Beth, that complement is really important in early neural development. And so that, I'll really won't touch on, but that's really uh, the topic of Jesse's, Jesse's talk. So the, in thinking of a simplified view of the, of the complement system, this, I came up with this a few years ago for a review, and the idea is to show that there, we know there are at least three different ways that complement system can be activated, and so that really has been used as a way to define the complement system into three distinct pathways, although you'll learn they're not distinct, they're, they interact at different stages, but we think of the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternative pathway as the three ways that complement gets activated, and then some of the components downstream differ, but as I mentioned, they interact with each other. And so I'd like to just spend a few minutes going through this. Uh, the classical pathway we probably are most familiar with because it's, it was one of the first pathways that was identified by Bourdais and, other, and his colleagues that antibody complexes are very effective, certain isoforms of IgG, always IgM, are very effective at activating the first component, C1. So even though we, we identified the first component as C1, what's interesting to, to keep in mind is that C1 actually represent, is, circulates in your blood as a complex of three different enzymes. It's, it's C1, which is this large uh, collagen, um, globular complex, and many of you have seen these elegant visions. It looks like a stalk of um, a bunch of tulips. It's been defined with six heads, which actually represents uh, multiple chains of, of A, B, and C. But the C1 complex actually also includes two serine proteases with a stoichiometry of two, uh, two molecules of C1R and two molecules of C1S co-circulating with C1. And it's RNS, or the, the serine proteases, that are, the, that are actually doing the business to activate C2 and C4. So the complement cascade, like, like the blood clotting cascade, is a cascade of serine proteases acting on different substrates and, and then re resulting in a catalytic unit. And so in this case, C1, as it changes its structure on binding immunoglobulin, activates sterically C1R, which, which is a protease that activates C1S. C1S then is the active enzyme that, that catalytically activates C2 and C4. C2 is also a serine protease that when, it, when it's activated, forms an interaction with C4. C4's role is mainly to act as an anchor. It has this internal thioester, uh, that I'll come back to it in, in a few minutes, that anchors it to, to the target of where it's activated. And so, and we'll spend some time on that in a few minutes. But C2 and C4 now form a heterodimer, and this heterodimer, with C2 being the active enzyme, cleaves C3. And then now you have C3, you have actually a triplex of C2, C4, and C3. Uh, bear with me, it's, it's not going to always be, uh, I can remember all these details, but this is an important aspect, because it, this is really, activation of C3 is the central component, 
as you'll learn, and it's really the component that, that many of the con control proteins are focused on. So C2 and C4 and C3 now form this complex, and C3 modifies its binding so that C2 now activates C5. And so this is basically, I think, what you, if you re just remember this, that C1 is activating C2 and C4, and that's activating C3, and that really kicks off the cascade, resulting in, in a number of downstream events. From the simplest, I think, set of events is optimization, which we're all familiar with, with bacteria we know get coated not only with antibody, but with complement, and then that provides ligands for a number of receptors that I'll come to in a few moments. So turning things on in the immune system is, is often easy. What's more important is how they're regulated and turning, turning them off. So I'll just mention a few control proteins, something that hasn't really been looked at in the brain. I don't know if Jesse will mention this. It's something we're beginning to think about, which is C1 inhibitor. Well, we discussed C1 circulating with RNS, these two serine proteases, but there's another compound, there's another protein called C1 inhibitor, which is a bait and trap type substrate. So when, when it gets cleaved by C1S, it actually binds covalently to C1S, inhibiting its further, further activity. And it was, it, it was discovered a number of years ago um, Fred Rosen was, was the physician who first recognized it was C1 inhibitor that was responsible, it was absence of C1 inhibitor that was responsible for Hain disease, which is hereditary angioedema. It's, it's, it's this uh, severe choking and contraction uh, and, and spasms of the bronchio that can lead to, to death. Um, Fred, in his genius, figured out it was, it was C1 inhibitor protein and, and um, established a, um, a therapy for re forgiving, generally it's boys who have this, have this, are more sensitive to this defect. Um, another, um, actually this, this might be an important point is that C1 inhibitor actually acts as a bridge between the, the contact sensitivity system uh, as, well, as well as the complement system. So it sits on, on the blood clotting cascade to prevent activation of, of the kinin pathway. And so it's the kinin that's released by the other pathway that gets, that causes the, the, the blood, the, the spasms and the choking that we, we think of as in terms of Hain disease. C1, C4 binding protein is a regulatory protein for C4. C4B gets activated and to shut it off, the regulated C4 binding protein binds it and then serves as a cofactor for its cleavage by factor I. And then complement receptor one, which is on cell surface, um, which is on the surface of, of um, many hematopoietic cells, in, at least in humans, also acts to um, bind C4B and prevent uh, its further activation through serving as a cofactor for cleavage. So this is a theme that we'll see throughout the complement system, that one, one way to shut it off is one, there's this ubiquitous protein, serine factor I, which again is a serine protease, that's in circulation and in the tissues. And so, but it, and it's, it alone is not enough to target the individual activated components. It's really the cofactor that's either on the cell surface or in the blood, like C4 binding protein, that bi recognizes the activated fragment, that exposes a, a cleavage site for factor I, and then that inactivates component by, by cleavage. So um, just an example uh, in, in terms of activation of the classical pathway, we think of antibody uh, binding the target, resulting in activation C1 and C4 and C2, as I just mentioned. 4 and, and 2 convert C3 to its active form, and then it binds covalently to the target, usually through an ester linkage. C4 also has this covalent uh, uh, binding uh, affinity, and, and Jesse will go into that in a little more detail. So I just put this in as a, as a historic reminder. It was Rodney Porter who first worked out the structure of, of immunoglobulin and then later turned his attention to complement proteins. And he's, his group um, was also a pioneer in, in discovery of the structure of C1 and a number of the other complement proteins that, that we, we know of today in the classical pathway. So there are other regulators to activate the, uh, the classical pathway. Uh, most recently, SINAR1, which many of us know is, a, is a, a cell surface molecule on certain dendritic cells and certain macrophages, 
There was a very nice paper a few years ago from Rockefeller showing that SINAR1 actually binds C1Q, and that can, once it binds C1Q, that can activate the classical pathway at the site at the, of the cell surface. Other serum recognition proteins, CRP, we hear a lot about in terms of, of um, as an early marker for inflammation. CRP itself is, is, a, is a serum protein that when it binds its target can activate C1Q leading to downstream classical pathway activation. So here, I, this is, you know, I've taken this from Janeway. It just lists a few of the complement receptors that um, didn't have, I won't have time to go through in much detail. CR1 is, is one we've mentioned already. It regulates the classical pathway. CR1 and 2 we'll come back to in a bit, but it really is more uh, localized primarily on D cells, FDC and some T cells. CR3 or C, C3B, we know, bind C3B. It's, it's the common receptor on all hematopoietic cells. It's, so this, it's binding C3B as a, and, and an inactivated fragment of C3B is, uh, IC3B is an important um, way to, to pull out pathogens or immune complexes that bear, bear inactivated C3. And then the anaphylatoxin C3A and C5A, and we'll, I'll come back to these in a few minutes. But these are the small peptides that get cleaved off of C3 and C5 when they're activated. But just to go back to the, to, the class, to the pathway map, the lectin pathway is we uh, know less about, although I think many of the, the major fragments now have been, have been identified. We think of the, the, man in, the lectin pathway as more important in host protection from bacterial infection, so individuals that are deficient in some of the key components such as MBL or the um, associated serine proteases are very prone to infectious disease. MBL actually looks a lot like C1Q. It structurally is very similar. It's a combined globular protein collagen complex. It circulates with the serine pro mass associate mass means um, MBL associated serine proteases. So it acts a lot in the same way. It binds to its lectin target. It um, the serine proteases get activated. Then they Actually, now you have an interaction with C2 and C4. So this early lectin pathway is a way to activate the classical pathway through C2 and C4. And then the downstream events are, are very similar. And the alternative pathway is, is probably, it's one of the more recent ones but identified, but it's uh, phylogenetically, it's probably the oldest pathway. It really, um, the way I like to think about it is C3 is spontaneously activated all the time, and it basically paints everything in your, it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept of a way to protect the host against bacterial infection is just paint everything with, C, with C3, and then if, it, if it's not blocked, it must, be, it must be fine and attack it. And that's the way it works. So uh, many uh, certain microorganisms have developed complement regulators like human cells or like mammalian cells as a way to protect themselves. Um, but it's a very effective way of, of discriminating self from non-self. It's also a very dangerous way to do it because if you're cell or you have a genetic uh, mutation, so you have a reduced level of a cofactor that's protecting that cell, then that cell is, is set up for, for elimination. And I'll, I'll show you an example um, of that in a few minutes. So there are a number of control proteins, as, as you would imagine, because the alternative pathway is dangerous. If every cell is getting hit with C3B spontaneously, then it's essential that that cell has a receptor, or what we call a control protein, to turn it off, or a serum protein. So of these factors, again, I list factor I. Factor H is, is a blood protein, so it's, it's present in the tissues and it's present in the blood. We know from genetic studies that individuals that have a mutation mutations in factor H that reduce their functional activity develop AMD, uh, macular degeneration, and atypical uh, hereditary um, uh, uremic syndrome, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Factor I, no, uh, in, in humans, no deficiencies in factor I have been identified. It, it's likely lethal embryonically. Decay activating, accelerating factor, and membrane cofactor these are two cell surface proteins that are expressed on all cells. Um, although mice don't have membrane cofactor, they have another protein called CRRY that has this similar function. But it basically, this is one of the proteins that's clear 
important for if a target binds, C3B is bound, then it inactivates, it has, acts as a cofactor for factor I to cleave the activated C3B and, and inactivate it. And then C, CD59 is also expressed on all cells and it acts to disrupt C8 through C9, which are more lytic. So of these, of these um, control proteins listed, they're all were initially identified by human diseases such as PNH and atypical uh, uh, HUS, which can be fatal. Uh, C5 has gotten a lot of attention the, recently from, uh, Alexion has developed a monoclonal antibody that blocks C5 activation. And I think that's garnered a lot of attention from other pharmaceutical companies because it's turned out to be a blockbuster drug. It's the only, only drug available at this point that, that can act as a cure for PNH or HUS. Uh, the alternative for these patients is um, um, bone marrow transplant. So it, it's really been a lifesaver. So just a, a little bit of uh, these diagrams really illustrate that most of these control proteins, as well as C3, uh, CR2 receptor, have repeat structures. Um, these can be called sushi domains. They're complement control protein repeats. They have different names. They basically are made up of 60 amino acid repeats that have four, four dissolved blood bonds that hold it together in a defined structure. And so CR1, for instance, may have over 20, 21 of these repeats. CR2 has 15. MCP only has four. DAF has four. C4 binding protein has seven chains made up of these repeat units. So it's, it's a structure that's been used in evolution and, and it's a very effective in binding different targets. C3, the other, I think the other feature of this is that it results in a rigid structure. So like CR1 um, has this rigid rod-like structure and that, I think, projects it away from the cell surface to facilitate its, its ability to inactivate activated complexes that are on its surface. So just, I'll just spend a couple of minutes um, on this diagram, it, which really illustrates what was a breakthrough, I think, in the complement field uh, roughly a decade ago by Fiat Gross. And he was really the first to crystallize one, a complement protein. And C3 had, had been a target for a number of years, but because of its large size, had been, very, had, had been difficult to crystallize and, and determine its structure. But what it illustrates is that the packing of C3 this TED domain, the TED domain, is the thioester domain, the region of the protein that has, has this thioester um, uh, built in. It's protected from water, of course, because it, if it, once it goes off, the molecule becomes, it either attaches to the host tissue or it, it's inactivated. But on cleavage, the C3A peptide is released, this green wedge, exposing the thioester domain, resulting in, in a pretty dramatic change in overall structure. Thioester forms a, tar a target, uh, forms a covalent bond with its target, either ester or amide. And then once it's anchored to the surface, now you have a, you, you basically increase the efficiency of the pathway because now it's, it's, you have it uh, attached to a solid phase. But it also provides a target for inactivation. And so factor I plus its cofactor, if this is a cell surface, then maybe DAFs, CD55, along with factor I will act to inactivate C3 through a cleavage in the alpha chain, and then subsequent cleavages result in uh, a final product of, of maybe 35 uh, kilodaltons that's, that's a stable component of C3 that's a, an opsonin for several complement uh, receptors. So C4 is, is inactivated stepwise in a similar process. But it, the dangerous, I think dangerous, on one hand, it's, it's if you're for host protection, you need this early formation of C3B, but it's also important that it's inactivated in a regulated way. So I have already mentioned factor I and factor H and their deficiency results or mutations, even a mutation resulting in reduced efficiency can lead to, to um, uh, glomerulonephritis and, and and uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, or atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is just one, one cartoon and, uh, illustrating the idea that if either through the classical pathway, the alternative pathway, C3B lands on the cell surface, especially if this is a blood vessel, 
where one could result in leakage, that it's critical to turn it off. And failure to turn off C3V results in its catalytic activity, forming a number of C3V molecules that can lead to, to leakage, cell leakage and, and associated sequelae. However, what hap should happen in a normal event, MCP, which is one of the control proteins I mentioned, this rod structure interacts with, with C3B, and then in the presence of factor I, C3B is cleaved to, to shut off this uh, catalytic uh, addition of additional C3 molecule. So uh, a lot of attention has been paid to factor VIII structure because I mean, mutations that don't result in, in loss of, of expression, but just mutated, reduce its ability to interact with C3 are the key, um, can lead to AMD, as I mentioned, and, and, um, and other um, vascular diseases. I'm gonna skip this. I just mentioned this is uh, one or two slides left, that the proteins, the cell surface receptors that bind C3A and C5A, the peptides that are released on activation of C3 and C5, have um, very potent activity. They're expressed on endothelial cells or expressed on a number of myeloid cells. But in endothelial cells, they're critical because the activation of C3A and C3B, um, I'm sorry, C3A and C5A can result in vascular leakage, which is a, which is a critical syndrome for, um, for um, well, vascular leakage in the, in the downstream event. So I'll stop here. I'll just conclude that complement activation and release of an aflatoxin C3A and C5A, they're, they're also dangerous in that they can activate mast cells. Release of inflammatory mediators such as TNF-alpha and histamines can result in vascular permeability and recruitment of inflammatory cells. Activation of complement leads to covalent attachment of C3 products to antigen facilitating phagocytosis via complement receptors. And recognition of bacteria through immunoglobulin, such as natural IgM, uh, is, and lectin proteins results in complement activation and clearance. And then it's becoming increasingly apparent that a number of uh, that sterile inflammation, we often think of, of RNA and DNA sensors and TLR, TLRs as important for host protection in a sterile way, but complement can also be activated uh, through um, a similar different pathways, and, um, and this is an area I think that's under, under more immediate research. So I'll stop and take any questions if, before we go on to Jesse's talk. Steve? So you might tell me that we should wait for Jesse's talk, but... Um, I think it's okay. Uh, just a few. Yeah. I mean, so um, presumably something in the central nervous system is doing something analogous in releasing these complement components. Right. And um, just do we have any real background on that, or is that still? <laughs> we don't. I think that's the issue. That Beth made an important observation that C4 is required yeah. and C3 is required, but the cells that are making C4 and C3 and C1, um, how are they regulated? Do we, and I don't, at this point, unless Beth knows, there really is very little data out there on the regulators, C4 binding protein, mm -hmm. uh, although I think there is a, a C4 binding protein-like cell surface molecule expressed on neurons that may may have this ability. So, and then you know, just your last point about the, the vascular effects. I mean, presumably, in normal development, the concentrations of complement proteins may be too low, but in brain inflammation or even in Alzheimer's disease, right. um, where you know, may perhaps there's more complement protein produced. Uh, we always think of, um, uh, of various angiopathies driven by amyloids in, in Alzheimer's disease, but mm -hmm. might there be some complement driven component with overflow of complement binding to endothelia? Or is that also just yeah. not known? No, I think, I mean, one, I think it's quite clear that local comp complements made locally, and I think we're, there's, a dear, there's a need to identify the, cells, the cell source and how it's actually regulated. But we, I think uh, Jonathan Kipnis, who was here not long ago, reminded us that the brain is not an isolated organ from the rest of the body, and we and others are showing that cytokines like interferon have, can freely diffuse across the blood-brain barrier. And 
there's beginning to be some evidence that peripheral cytokines like interferon can alter levels of local complement expression. So I think that's something else to keep in mind. It's not all about just with what's happening in the brain, but peripheral uh, activity can also influence some of these pathways. So Mike, I was wondering, um, since you mentioned it early on in the talk, given the emerging genetics in Alzheimer's that's implicated CR1 as one of the risk genes, oh, yeah. so SNPs and CR1, which is in late onset Alzheimer's, and if you look at the brain atlas and if you look at all our single cell data, I mean, it's very little or low expression of CO1 in the brain. Even in disease conditions, you don't see a lot. So I guess I'm wondering, like, what you think, given your knowledge of CR1, which obviously is really a key receptor for the complement system, like, does that, that's suggesting a peripheral component, but do you have any insight about mechanism or what one might, might think about for starting to understand the yeah. basis for that genetic link? Well, we think of CR1 like, like the other control proteins. It's on, generally, it's, it's on a cell surface, and it's, it's acting as a guardian if, if once C3B gets activated and C4B, because it also regulates C4B, then it's, it's imperative to really to cut off further activation. So um, what's the threshold of level of expression that's needed? So it may be it's expressed in, on cells that we're just not... We haven't detected it yet. Like we find it's difficult to detect C3. We know it's there. It's functionally important. But antibody staining has been, it's been pretty evasive. So I think even though these components are, are expressed, that may not show up in atlases yet, but they may be there, and they may be critical, and it might be only through knockouts uh, that we can infer their, their activity. I have just a related but more basic question. So all of the, you, you meant you listed like half a dozen different complement receptors. They're right. all receptors for C3, is that right? Most of them are C3, yeah. Okay. But, um, so I know the most obviously about CR3 because that's on microglia and acts as a receptor to trigger phagocytosis, but the other receptors have different downstream functions. Well, yeah, optimization, I think, that, if I think about one key role complement forms, it's optimization and clearance of synapses. That's a perfect example, and we'll hear a bit from Jesse. But it's C3 binding to something, and then a receptor on the, on the CR3 receptor and CR4 receptor, which doesn't really get much attention. But CD11C, which is on all dendritic cells, is a complement CR4 receptor. It seems to have more potent activity in terms of activation of the, of the DC, as opposed to CR3, which is more of a it's often described as a very weak opsonon, opsonic receptor, and we don't normally think of CR3 as activating the cell. It's more of taking something out of the, out of the, the environment rather than activating the macrophage, for instance. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I know about. They're, they're also integrants, so they, these receptors do a lot of other things. Okay, do you hear me well? So hi, I'm Jesse. I'm uh, really happy to be here to talk to you today about the role of classical component cascade in synaptic pruning. So when I started, my background is in immunology. When I started my postdoc with Mike uh, almost seven years ago, um, I was very fortunate that we started this collaboration with Beth Stevens and Steve McCarroll uh, to really go uh, for me into this new field of uh, neuroimmunology. Uh, so that's my. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk today about uh, neurodegeneration, but we'll focus further on neurodevelopment and uh, talk about synaptic pruning as we are start learning how synaptic pruning is regulated and how it's happening. Uh, but there's still a long road uh, uh, to understand fully synaptic pruning. So it is a normal uh, uh, process during, that's happening during brain development and after exponential synaptogenesis that happens during uh, embryo and early childhood. Uh, this is followed by uh, a dramatic loss of synapses um, that uh, refines uh, mature neuronal circuits. And this is, it is well shown he, here uh, on this Golgi staining where you can see that between one month and uh, 2.5 years, there is a really huge increase of uh, dendritic spines on the dendrite and then 
um, uh, later on in life during um, uh, childhood and, and until early adulthood, there's a decrease, uh, uh, a neurodevelopmental decrease of uh, synapses. And so there are several mechanisms that have been involved into uh, synaptic pruning, and one of them is the classical complement cascade, uh, well described by Beth Stevens. So um, I'm pretty sure you all know about that, but I'm going to uh, remind you about the retinogenic clade system that is a, a very well established model used to define synaptic pruning. And so uh, we use uh, flore fluorescent uh, uh, tracers to label retinogenic clade cells in the eyes and to label their projections into the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus. And when we do that, we can observe that in P5 animals, there is uh, projections from both eyes in the ipsilateral region that you can see uh, in yellow here. But then by P10 and later on P30, um, the, uh, the projections from both eyes have very defined territories and there is almost no overlapping between those two regions anymore. And that's what we measure. We measure the overlapping region. And then um, uh, when uh, we looked at C1Q, uh, uh, C4, C3, and CR3 knockout mice, we uh, observed that there was uh, an impaired synaptic pruning and there was still intermingling um, uh, projections into this ipsilateral territory in the LGN. Uh, showing that there was a defect in synaptic pruning in the C4 knockout mice, in the, in the complement, in the classical complement uh, knockout mice. Uh, and then later on, uh, uh, Dory Schaefer in Best Lab showed that this mechanism was uh, microglia dependent, uh, using the same principle, inje in injecting fluorescent tracer, then you can uh, observe that microglia starts to engulfing to engulf uh, synaptic projections. And um, she noticed that the peak of engulfment was happening at P5, and then uh, later on in life, in development, there was no, uh, at least a lot less uh, engulf engulfment happening there. And um, just to confirm that it was really uh, microglia, uh, that, that the complement cascade wa was uh, playing with microglia to uh, eliminate synapse, uh, she looked at CR3 knockout mice and found that uh, engulfment was uh, uh, also uh, impaired in, the, in those mice. So that led, to, that, that led to the model, the following model that C1Q uh, is uh, activated in an activity dependent manner uh, and uh, deposited on synapse, which in turn activate C3, C4, C4. Uh, and that forms the C3 convertase, as Mike explained to you, um, and that leads to the activation of C4, of C3. And C3 is then recognized by complement receptor 3 and engulfed by microglia. Uh, and uh, for the rest of the talk now, I'm going to focus on complement C4, which is what we're working on in the lab. Um, uh, and uh, the, the unique... Um, C4 is, is a very unique component among the classical complement cascade because of its very complex locus. So uh, I'm sure from you, you, you all heard uh, the work from Steve and uh, you all know that there is uh, three different types of variation in the complement C4 locus in human, which is located in the chromosome 6 uh, in the HLA3 region. Uh, first of all, you can have the gene... Um, a long form and a short form due to the integration of this herb uh, region. Um, there, you, there is also a duplication of the gene and, oops, sorry. And then uh, one can have uh, up to uh, eight copies uh, of, um, of C4. Uh, and uh, the last variation is um, that there are two alleles of C4, C4A and C4B, that are almost 99% identical, but differ uh, um, uh, most only in the isotypic region. And there are actually only f uh, four amino acids uh, of, uh, that are different between those two alleles. And I come back uh, later to the function of that. Uh, just to quickly remind you that uh, uh, 
uh, if you want to go into a mouse model, there is unfortunately uh, uh, no C4 or C4B in a mouse. There is only one mouse C4, and then SLP, which is actually uh, not expressed in all the, the, the mouse trains. And the particularity of the mouse C4 is that it, is that it is an hybrid between human C4A and human C4B. Um, and um, uh, I'm just gonna jump into uh, the results from Steve uh, to, uh, uh, that, that showed that C4A increased copy number was associated, associated with the schizophrenia risk, uh, as you all know. And then uh, we, we know already from like almost 20 years that uh, there is a reduced density of synaptic structures in uh, the prefrontal cortex of schizophrenia patients. So that led us to uh, the, uh, the, the, the hypothesis that C4A mediated synaptic pruning uh, was associated with schizophrenia when there is too much C4 uh, in the environment, in the brain development. And so he also uh, showed that uh, uh, if you, uh, increased C4 copy number uh, leads to increased C4 expression. So it is well known in periphery in the serum that the more C4A or C4 copy you have, the more C4 protein you have in, in the serum. But it is also true in the brain. Uh, and on top of that, independently of uh, gene copy number, um, uh, schizophrenia patients show an ele elevated uh, C4X, C4A expression. Uh, and uh, I wanted to go a little deeper into the expression since we want to know more about the regulation of human C4. So it's uh, uh, also in, um, in Ashwin's paper, uh, um, that uh, they show that C4A is expressed in, in different, in several regions, uh, in several brain regions, uh, and um, at, at different levels, but there is no particular region where we can say C4 is more expressed and that's where it's, it's working in priority, you know? So we have to take that into account. Uh, now, what about cell type expressing uh, C4? So, uh, they found that uh, by doing IHC, but also by uh, uh, culturing um, neurons, that C4 was expressed by neurons, and you can see, uh, you can see here the co-staining between um, C4 and UN um, on brain sections, and also C4 is secreted by, ne by neurons since we can find it in a supernatant of a neuronal culture. But in culture of microglia, we were not able to see any C4 produced. Uh, so this is a big difference between the periphery. Macrophages do express a lot of C4, and in the brain, it seems that microglia do not express C4. Uh, that makes them very particular macrophages. Um, and uh, also, it has been shown uh, 20 years ago that uh, human astrocytes can express C4 as well. Um, and what about in the mouse? So I just took that from uh, um, the great uh, tool uh, that uh, uh, RP and Steve uh, uh, designed, which is DropWiz, to look at uh, C4B uh, expression from their uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. And what you can see here is that astrocytes seems to be uh, highly expressing C4 in the mouse. And then there is also ependymal cells. But we do not find, uh, I mean, they didn't, uh, they do not see from this data that uh, neurons express, uh, express C4. And there is also another tool uh, that I found very useful, which is similar uh, data, RNA single cell RNA sequencing data, it's uh, from mousebrain.org, and they also show here that ependymal cells in the brain uh, express C4 and also astrocytes, but, um, uh, and if neurons do express C4, I don't know if you can see here, but it, it is at, at very low level. Uh, so now, so there's definitely more, much more work to do to define uh, the cell type that are, that are expressing C4, both in mouse and human. Um, now, when C4 is expressed, where, what is it doing? Where is it going? And so um, uh, we were able to detect some C4 deposition on the synapse um, in, in, uh, in human samples. Uh, and we also do have this kind of data in mouse brains now. Uh, but how I wanted to go deeper into uh, uh, 
the activation of C4 and how it can bind to uh, its target, which is in our case the synapse. Uh, so um, Mike explained already with C3 and C4 is very similar. C4 has three uh, chains, it is a big protein, and then when it's activated by C1S, there is a cleavage of the C4 little a uh, that change the conformation of C4, open it and make the tyroester available for um, binding, covalent binding to its target. And then uh, later on, C4 is, C4 is uh, inactivated by factor I and then cofactor C4. B binding protein. Uh, and I put this little isotopic region, if you remember, it is the difference between C4 and C4B and it's very close to this tyroester. And so uh, to explain uh, now the, the, the biggest difference between C4A and C4B, it's, it relies in their binding properties. And so because the difference is in the isotopic region, uh, uh, work of, uh, of Mark, Mike, but also uh, David Eisenman, showed that this, the isotopic region is actually driving the, the, the tyroester uh, uh, binding into an ester bond in the case of C4B and into an amide bond in, this, in the case of um, C4A. And so what that means is, is, is that C4A is like C4B is actually uh, more potent to bind carbohydrate-rich surfaces, whereas C4A binds more efficiently proteins. And so in that, in that case, um, immune complex was used uh, to show that C4A binds more uh, potently to proteins. Um, additional uh, properties that I wanted to add is that uh, C4A C4, and C4B have similar C1S dependent activation. They also activate C3 in a, in a similar manner uh, and are also regulated uh, in the same way by factor I and uh, C4 binding protein. And, um, and as uh, Mike and, and Beth uh, mentioned earlier, uh, there, is, there is very low expression of factor I and C4 binding protein in the brain or at least, and also from all this new single cell RNA sequencing, we really don't find a lot of expression. So what is regulating C4 in the brain is still it remains um, a big question. And as well as what is C4 is binding to in the brain, is it just binding to a target or is, is, is there a receptor that recognizes C4 and is able to help the elimination also on synapse via C4 and not only via C3? So that's still a question. Uh, now, for the next, the last part of, of the talk, I wanna talk about two different models. How can we study this? So we can study, so some people have just recently developed uh, and uh, published an in vitro model that seemed to be very relevant to look at the role of C4A. So this paper has just been published in Nature Neuroscience. And it's a group at uh, MGH that uh, use microglia derived from monocyte from schizophrenia patients and, uh, and neurons derived from fibroblasts from schizophrenia patients. And what they show here is that when they co-culture uh, microglia neuron from schizophrenia patients, they see uh, less uh, spine density in this condition compared to healthy control neurons with healthy control microglia. And uh, they also uh, compared um, the microglia uh, engulfment uh, when, uh, so they also isolated microglia from schizophrenia patients and then feed them with synapse, synaptosomes um, enriched from uh, neuronal culture that had only one C4A copy or two C4A copy and they can see an increased phagocytic indexed with uh, more C4A present uh, in, on the synaptosomes. So um, this, is, this is really supporting the hypothesis that uh, increased C4A expression and increased C4A binding on synaptosomes uh, can uh, increase phagocytosis by microglia. Uh, 